Um, following the structure I suggested before, I'm now going to ask Mark to respond to some of those points, um, maybe for about five minutes or so, five, ten minutes. And then I will get uh, Dariush to speak again in response. I don't really have a prepared response to this, so I guess I'll make a number of comments that are only going to be loosely linked together. Um, I, I disagree with much of what Mr. Byendorf said, uh, at least about the coup itself, although not so much with the things he said in the earlier part of his presentation. Let me just address a number of, of the points that he raised. Um, one point he made was that the military plan was based on what he called the sheer accident that there was already an existing military network that was planning some kind of action. Um, it certainly is true that when George Carroll and Abbas Farzanagan came to Tehran to organize a military network, they certainly worked with military officers who were already anti Mossadegh. There's no doubt about that. Um, and they, you know, from various sources, tried to get information about which colonels were pro Mossadegh, which ones were anti Mossadegh. Uh, but there is no evidence that I'm aware of that these colonels that they finally <coughs> recruited had been actively plotting beforehand. If they had, why didn't they carry out a coup, you know, in February 1953 or in April or in June or something like that? Why is it that they carried out a coup only after the CIA team had begun to plan it and implement it? It's not a coincidence, in my view, that the coup occurred exactly when the CIA team was there in Tehran to carry it out. So there's no doubt there were Iranians plotting beforehand, but none of those plots got anywhere near succeeding until the Americans came along. So my interpretation of that is, is that it took an American role to sort of catalyze and bring together and encourage these plotters to do it. Um, Mr. Bayandor made uh, a big emphasis on uh, the initial coup plot, the, what he calls the Ajax plot, not having a follow-up option. As I said, though, in my earlier presentation, I don't really need to repeat it, uh, Roosevelt's intention all along was to improvise. You know, his focus was to put together a whole series of capabilities that could be used uh, as needed, depending on how events played out during uh, the coup period. Um, the plan for a military insurrection from Kermanshah. This comes from Artish Yerzahadi. Uh, Artish Yerzahadi, over the years, beginning really 60 years ago, has written uh, several things on this, mentioning a plan that they had to uh, create a base in the western region of Iran, which his father, I guess, had served in, and perhaps was from, I'm not sure, no. um, in the Kermanshah region. Not in Kermanshah, he was commander in his country. Okay. So, you know, Ardashir Zahidi has been saying this, that they had this plan to set up uh, what in one publication he called a free Iran uh, and base an insurrection from there. First of all, I never heard this from any of the sources that I talked to. None of the CIA guys knew anything about this. And I asked several of them specifically about this. I believe I even asked Kermit Roosevelt about this because I had information about this from Zahedi way back then. So none of them had heard about it. In any case, if they planned to create a free Iran located in the area of Kermanshah, why is it then that the Kermanshah garrison commander, uh, Colonel Nasseri, uh, no, but Bakhtiar. Bakhtiar. Why is it that Bakhtiar marched to Tehran he just at the time there. that the Zahedi were the going to go to his place. That They were going to meet on the road in between. Created. He didn't march to Tehran. He could not march to Tehran. All the sources that I've seen say that he did. A um, couple of other points. Um, you said that the CIA team did not bribe the clerics, something like that. Right. Uh, 
I, I briefly mentioned this in my presentation. Uh, two of the CIA personnel, the station chief and another one, gave $50,000 to an intermediary that they think gave, or they thought gave the money to Kashani, but they don't know that it went for sure. So it's not, you know, I have no concrete evidence that Kashani was involved. Uh, it seems pretty clear that Ayatollah Bekbahani, who Mr. Bayandor mentioned, uh, did receive CIA money uh, and did play some role in organizing the crowds. How important that role was, how much money he received, and exactly who gave it to him, I don't have evidence on. But I am quite certain from the various sources that I've seen uh, that Ayatollah Bekbahani got some of the CIA's money. Um, Kermit Rose, uh, I already talked about that one. Uh, that Kermit Roosevelt misled Washington, he didn't really mislead Washington, he just didn't send a telegram back to Washington after they sent a telegram to him telling him to give up, so. But he um, said that Mossad okay, going... Okay, you, you can explain, you can explain. He's you, dead um, to say. Uh, anyway, the two final things I would say, you know, my, my, my two most important points to make in rebuttal to Mr. Bayondor are, first of all, he largely ignores the very broad range of actions that I explained earlier, the seven major steps the CIA took and then the steps taken by the State Department. You know, he's really focusing just on who organized the crowds on the morning of August 19th. In my view, that's really a pretty minor part of the coup. Much more important is the various steps that the CIA undertook in the weeks and months before the coup to put together a military network, to flood Iran with anti-Mossadegh propaganda, uh, to bring money to Tehran, to organize people, and other kinds of things. So he's really kind of missing the forest for the trees. The CIA was doing a wide range of things. Uh, the coup was much more than just a question of organizing crowds in the early morning of August 19th. Uh, finally, I would say that uh, I'm certainly not making the argument, and never have made the argument, that the United States was the only actor responsible for the coup. There were broadly three sets of actors, the United States, the British, and then various Iranian actors. And if you go through carefully who did what, and I do this in the conclusion of the Gazarowski and Byrne book that many of you are aware of, uh, if you go through and carefully identify who did what, uh, my conclusion is that the United States played by far the largest role. It's not to say the British didn't have a contribution, they did. Not to say that Iranian actors didn't have a contribution, they did. But it was the United States that largely orchestrated this. I guess I should add one last point, and that is that toward the end of his presentation, Mr. Bayondor uh, talked repeatedly about the activities of Ayatollah uh, Borgogirdi, who was the, the, the Marja of the era. I've never seen any evidence that he played any kind of a role in this or acquiesced in this. Uh, all the evidence that I've ever seen casts a great deal of doubt on that. And there's uh, an article that Fakhruddin Azami wrote focusing a lot on this uh, last year uh, that addresses this issue. He knows more, much more about it than I do. So in any case, uh, I, I very respectfully disagree with uh, Mr. Bayandor's analysis. Dr. Kesiriovsky just mentioned that uh, much of uh, the thesis that he had developed over a couple of decades, in fact, has been based on his interviews with a group of former CIA officers who had served during the TP. TP be done and later TPH uh, Had, instead of that, Professor Gasiriovsky gone to real actors? And by that I mean people such as Ambassador Henderson, such as Dr. Qalam Hussein Sadiqi, who was Mossad Deq's interior minister. He was the one who was involved in every step of the way. And both of them, they were still alive in early 80s. I think his conclusions would have been different. Security officers, intelligent officers, by the nature of their appointment, are living in wild, walled environment, cut from uh, 
the, 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 the real world. And I still, I'm still puzzled by, 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 by the fact that uh, a major his a chapter of Iranian history is written on the basis of remote recollections, 30 years after the event, of a bunch of former spooks. I'm sorry to put it in those terms. To give one example, Dr. Kasilyovsky in his book says that in the morning, in the morning of Mr. Hashtam Murdad, Rashidian proposed that an emissary with $10,000 should be sent to Aramesh, who was a politician, Iranians know him, to pass on to Ayatollah Karshani in order to send out the crowd. First of all, at that moment, the train had already left the station. The crowds were already in the street as of the hour. Now, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you want to send an emissary to someone else to take $10,000 to, 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 to mobilize crowd is a little bit um, um, as stretching um, the, 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 the point. Other than that, you read the internal history and there is absolutely no trace of this. If that was a fact, why didn't they mention it? in the internal history of uh, the CIA. Uh, what I would do, in fact, if I have any criticism, I would say, all right, in 1980s, there wasn't much in terms of actual documentation available. And relying on testimonies of uh, former CIA agents, Acceptable, but early last decade, so 2000 and 2001, Dr. Gasiriovsky and his collaborators decided to, in fact, write a comprehensive account of the fall of the Mossad. After two conferences, one in Oxford, one in Tehran, seven top-notch academics, and I don't say this with any shred of irony, seven really top-notch academics, and Dr. Gasiriovsky I call, consider a top-notch academic. They sat together, and by then, the, 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 foreign, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, the State Department files, was out, and the internal history of CIA's so-called Wilbur account was already out. Instead of trying to fill out the gaps in the previous narrative, they simply decided to ignore the most fundamental, the most fundamental pieces of evidence from the Frost series, in other words, things such as a uh, record of Henderson's discussion with Mossadegh on 28, to allow the mythology to believe that that was part of the plot. Read, please, uh, all the scholars here, read that, that uh, record. It is in the Frost series. It's public document. You will see there is no shred of evidence that whatever um, um, uh, Henderson said in that meeting had any relevance any relevance to, to, to a plot or conspiracy. At any rate, to say that instead of filling those gaps in the light of uh, now revealed documents, they decided to ignore them or relegate them to footnotes. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I, just one, one, one point and I shut up, I promise you. What bothers me most is that as recently as two weeks ago, Professor Gasiyovsky's co-editor of that same book made a splash, media splash, by announcing that new CIA documents 
related to the coup has now been released. In other words, they, they, they have now the proof that we all were hoping for to solve the conundrum of Pistache de Mortat. They make a splash. Look at their uh, web page. You will see uh, not only the list of these documents, but maps, operational maps of Pistahash de Mordal in red color. And the innocent uh, uh, reader in the first look thinks that these are things, revelation, these are, these are maps coming out of the CIA files. And when you read the uh, small print, you'll find out that these are courtesies of Mr. Ali Rahnema who apparently is about to write a new book <laughs> saying the same all the stuff instantly what you said Dr. Azimi had written about Bruger he was not uh, Azimi it was Rahnema who did it any rate given the, the time restraints I'll, I'll, I'll stop here thank you Um, thank you both, and uh, I want to now um, invite one or two other people to uh, come in. Um, at the back, Siavos uh, Ranjbar Daimi, I think, would like to ask a question. Uh, yes, uh, sorry if I abuse of my organizer's status. Uh, Mr. Binder, I'm, I, I have to admit I was always interested by your thesis ever since your, the English version of your book com comes out. But I have a very fundamental criticism regarding your work, and uh, I think that you quite rightly say that one cannot write the history of that period based on remote sources. But it seems that you really uh, disregard the sources of that period, for example, the press of that period, in your analysis of certain uh, phenomena. For example, you say that Mossadegh's popular base was shrinking uh, as we enter 1953. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, since Siatir, uh, the crowds were out on the streets repeatedly uh, at times in which Mossadegh's authority was put under challenge by his opponents. And uh, the noise ran the crisis, which ended with crowds on the streets again back in Mossadegh, occurred when all of these so-called right-wing part of the National Front you were referring to, Bagoi, Kashoni, Maki, and Arizadeh, had split from the National Front. And uh, they split in a way that didn't take away the popular base of the parties. Uh, Bagoi and three or four other people took the Zahmat Kishan name with them. But the whole party went behind Maliki and his new Sevom in terms of street presence and elsewhere. Uh, so, if you look at the run-up to uh, the Bistoash Mordad, and especially the demo of Bistopanjim Mordad in Baharistan Square, you will realize that the more we progress towards Bistoash Mordad, the more the crowd presence in favor of Mossadegh is actually increasing, not shrinking. Then, uh, to be brief, because I don't want to take a lot of time, I think we really need to be careful on how we define Ayatollah Bourjadi's actions. First of all, Ayatollah Bourjadi did not boycott the referendum that you called rigged. He actually uh, uh, did, uh, refrained from supporting any move towards a boycott, despite the fact that Kashani and Behbani openly did so. So we can see that this was a clear instance when Kashani did one thing and Borgia did the other. And then I would like to draw your attention to uh, the main title of Milatemon, Shamsegana Tabadi's newspaper on Bistoash Mordad, which was Ayatollah Borgia, please break your silence, Tehran is in the hands of the Bolsheviks. Now, uh, I think we both agree that great marjas don't act in a cloak and dagger way. They act in an open way through fatwas. And uh, I think that the sense of this uh, title by Shamsagan Tawadi was that there was no fatwa. And Bourjadi had not indicated where his stance was in this confrontation between Mossadegh and his opponents. Uh, this is not a smoking gun. I don't want to say that from one newspaper title we can uh, draw a, a lofty historical conclusion on what Bourdieu's role was, but I think that the contemporary sources of the time should be given more attention. Uh, and I think that your work should really focus on them more, because uh, from that a number of your conclusions can be uh, challenged in a very significant way. Thank you. Is it right from here? Or? Yeah, sitting down is fine. Well, I think you, you raised a couple of points first that I have not carefully 
examined all the relevant documents and I must tell you that uh, the contrary is true because I'm the, not to say that I'm the only one, but in addressing these problems, I have only based myself on actual archive documents, what has been declassified. Of course, I have also spoken to people, I have looked at memoirs, uh, different actors have said different things, but what has been essential for me has been the archival documents. Now, you said, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, Mossadegh's support base had remained intact. Mossadegh's, in fact, height of popularity was CAT. We all know that. The question is not CAT. The question is after Noah is found, what the, how the situation evolved. If you, for instance, read, and this is in the New York Times website, you can easily access it, uh, an article by uh, Kenneth Love about a demonstration on the first anniversary of the CAT. You will see that he says that the size of the two-day demonstration that was separate from the National Front's uh, demonstration dwarfed that of uh, that of Mossadegh. In other words, Mossadegh could not gather a major crowd, whereas the two-day, in fact, had scared all the observers. So the fact. No, but, uh, but, uh, but please do go to the site and read this, because this man was there and he had seen it. Uh, sorry? He's saying, he, he's saying he, he inflated the numbers of two people. Well, inflate maybe he also inflated the number of people killed. Dr. Abramian um, uh, in his presentation said that there are only 3,000 people out in the street. Kenneth Love, in his um, um, uh, dispatch, which incidentally is published in the back cover of Dr. Gasiriovsky, I mean that, that dispatch of uh, Kenneth Love, says that 300 people were killed on that day. That means that 10% of people who were out in this... No, but, but I'm just saying that in exaggerating numbers, they, they could, everyone can play with numbers and figures. But what Kenneth Love said, and other sources, now I, can't, uh, I don't have it on uh, in my tab to tell you right away, I have seen it elsewhere, that that to the demonstration on the first anniversary of CAT scared a lot of people. So, as far as I'm concerned, indeed, uh, the, the, the support base of Mossadegh, after, especially after Noah's Fund, had been narrowed to two dead on the one hand, and the um, um, rather radical uh, faction of J.P. Mendy, uh, especially um, um, Dr. Fatin. As far as Bougirdi goes, I said in my presentation that I don't have any forensic evidence, but I said that there is a cluster of testimonies, evidence, and so on and so forth, and I have relied mainly, and that again is something that you can easily access on the website. Go and read the relevant chapter of uh, Montazeri's memoirs huh? on, 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 on that issue. And you will be surprised things that he, as the scribe to Khobman Brujerdi, has said about his way of looking at things. It is true, what you said, the point you made is quite correct. Buru Jerdi, first of all, generally his policy was not to speak out publicly. And unlike Kwashani, who proscribed, who, who in fact banned the referendum, neither Bepohani nor Buru Jerdi said nothing about it. But that did not mean that behind the scene they would not act. Whenever the high interest of Shia Islam was at the stake, they would come in. And 
you will see in the um, uh, if you, you go beyond Mr. Hashtag Mordav, you will see that in the subsequent years, Shah was very, uh, how shall I put that, not subservient, but had, uh, it was listening to, to what was coming from home. And one of those major incidents was was, was attack on Baha'i Temple that the, that, that Brujerdia that, that asked and the Shah complied. So there was always, whenever the, 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 the high interest of uh, Shia faith was involved, he would one way or the other act and those uh, pieces of evidence I've uh, proposed in, in my in chapter 7 of my book uh, suggest that, although I repeat, I have not been able, I don't think anyone could, present a piece of evidence that in a court of law you can present and prove it. But this is circumstantial evidence. Shafran. Um, uh, I wanted to, I, I think one emerges from this uh, debate is that uh, uh, we do not have a proper historiographical framework to evaluate oral history and these documents. I think this, this is a fundamental problem, that we do not have a proper framework for assessment. You see, one of the problems that I have with one, so many of these uh, so-called CIA archives is that we do not have a British equivalent to cross-examine them against. And then, uh, yes, it's, it's always the fault of the British. <laughs> and uh, and it, it is amazing that, that we do not have them. But on the other hand, the, the problem is that the CIA claims that the files have been destroyed and whatever. I still have difficulty believing in that. I mean, like, there must be some copies of something somewhere that would inform us about most of the correspondence, genuine co correspondence, that were going on about how the plan was concocted. So, uh, if ever we decide to put together a book on this topic, present company invited and included, I seriously suggest that we seriously discuss how we are going to, to assess the available evidence. And you see, that's what people generally do in other disciplines that they start to develop frameworks of assessment because there are a lot of overlaps. You guys do not necessarily disagree with each other in kind. Uh, this is very important to, to appreciate. The thing is that it has become quite fashionable to bash the United States with respect to everything that happens. And of course, Iranians, as was mentioned by Professor Gasirovsky, have a tendency to pocket the money, do nothing, and blame others for it. So, uh, I mean, like, uh, th this has to be really paid attention to. The second thing that I would like to uh, bring the attention of uh, our most uh, respectful audience and my eminent colleagues is that, um, as Sio Bush mentioned, is Sio Bush still here or he? Okay. So, uh, anyhow, the um, prior to the events of uh, March 1st of 1953, uh, we have mob rule in the streets of Tehran. I mean, like Shaq Barna Jafari and his gangs went and attacked a bunch of left-wing newspapers in December of 1951, or uh, is it 51 or 52, am I? I, I think it's December 1951. And as they attack all these left-wing newspapers, they become a magnet for the mob. Uh, uh, thousands of people join them. There were no CIA networks, there were no, uh, I mean like, it, it, Iran, as soon as some, crash, accident, car accident happens, a hundred people gather together to see what's going, what's going on and things like that. Not to mention that a bunch of thugs attacking things and there is opportunity for looting in, in, in post-war uh, economy of Iran that is very much stricken. We have to pay attention to the psychology of crowds 
and typologize that. It is extremely important. And with respect to the 1st of March 1953 events, there is no doubt that Behbahani and Kashani acted, and this is a criticism of you, Mr. Bayand, or I hope you forgive me. I do not believe that Burujerdi, who was quite reticent to enter into politics and wanted to maintain his neutrality, would order Behbahani that, okay, go and prevent the Shah from, from leaving the country or something. There was not enough time for these people to communicate like that, to, to make a decision. Telephone existed. Well, telephone existed, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact is that th there was not enough time to, to make a final decision like that, that would go and gather all these crowds and, and things like that. Burujerdi was a very slow man in decision making. Everybody knows that. I agree with you. So it was like he was not a general like Rommel who decides that, oh, the hell with Hitler, I'm going way to the channel, and the hell with the rest. No, it, it was not like that. Behbahani and Kashani masterminded Nohir's fan, of course with the help of most Turkish Shapur uh, Hamid Reza and Shapur Mahmoud Reza, who basically were there, and Daryusha Furuhar, of course, they gave them a boot as well, and it, it became quite a quarrel. But the fact is that uh, in the morning of, unlike uh, what Siobhan said, actually there were thousands of people in favor of the Shah in the morning of the 1st of March 1953. And there was, uh, there was no need for tens of thousands of CIA money. And if you can, if two clergy, with the help of one of the Shahpurs, who has a lot of Turkish friends, can gather so many people within two days, with all due respect, that one million dollars was flushed down the toilet by Iranians. And uh, there was, uh, th they could have done that. And one of the things that perhaps, uh, even though I am a loyal uh, subject of Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II of Canada, uh, I should say that as a, uh, as a person of Iranian heritage, I find it very interesting that Iranians are, even if they are against each other, are incapable, they need foreign money to organize themselves, they need foreign uh, thinking Americans to come and really, really, the 1st of March 1953 event, which was concocted to either uh, coerce Mossadegh or even kill him, was masterminded by Iranians without the help of the CIA. And you cannot drink uh, into a strong piece of wood. Shall I? <laughs> Okay, let me make a reply to that. Uh, I think most I never of us say, to the I research. certainly didn't say that Iranians are incapable of organizing crowds by themselves. Did I say that? No. no. Okay, all I said was the CIA had this covert operation that did stuff like that. Now, whether it had a big impact or not, I don't know, and I was very clear about that. So, you know, I'm not making up conspiracies of the CIA or the Canadians <laughs> or the British are behind everything. So who are you directing this at? One, one point he did raise. <laughs> one point he did raise is, is this question of um, CIA officers looking back at 1953. Um, we know that the CIA as an institution was very keen to take credit for what happened in 1953 and made use of the, I hesitate to use the word myth, but I'll use the word myth, used the, the myth of 1953 later to demonstrate its uh, success and power and influence, at least potentially when allowed to do what it liked, um, in the context of the Cold War. Now, this, I don't want to go too far down this route, but the CIA is an institution which, amongst its other uh, um, activities, engages in disinformation. How, how far should we accept those accounts at face value? I think that is a question involved in this. Well, let me mention a few I things about that. First of all, it's an interesting little footnote, and I don't really know entirely how to interpret this, that the CIA uh, basically planted an article in the Saturday Evening Post, which was at the time a fairly common American magazine in I believe it was September 1954 describing its role in the 1953 coup in broad terms. So they, they did publicize it back then. Now that may have been in the context of the elections that were 
coming up at that time. I don't really know why, but so they did. They did disseminate it back then. But since that time, of course, they did that covertly, so they were not in any open way claiming credit for the coup at the time. Um, since that time, until these recent revelations by Malcolm Byrne, which are very minor and not at all important, the CIA never, you know, released anything or made any kind of public admission that it played a role in the coup. It's true that Secretary of State Albright did, and, uh, and uh, President Obama said something about that. So they haven't openly admitted it. They didn't release any documents until these last one, uh, one sentence in this last one by Malcolm Byrne that indicated it. But, you know, the key CIA document that has come out about the coup was an official CIA history written by Donald Wilbur, who was the architect of the original plan of the coup, who was deeply involved in many aspects of it. Uh, the CIA did not release that. That somehow got out to the New York Times back in the year 2000. Now, that was written uh, in the six or eight months after the coup. Wilbur evidently was given the assignment to debrief whoever he could debrief, which I think meant Roosevelt and uh, George Carroll, and you know, write as complete of a history as he could at the time, and so he did. Um, internal CIA, CIA people, some CIA people were not satisfied with that history, so actually subsequently there were two other histories that were written within the CIA that were never meant to see the light of day, um, that were written to try to give a, a, a broader account or a better account of, uh, of the coup than Wilbur's account. Um, both of those have come out with a great deal of redactions. One of them, I believe, is the one that Peter Burns put on his website the other day. So the CIA has not uh, tried to give you know, a spun account of this, if that's what you're suggesting. And the, the main CIA account that is out there in the public record now was written in the months right after the coup. So there's no problem of a 30-year memory lag in that one. Now, with regard to my interviews, as I said, I did interview extensively uh, people who were involved in this in various ways, and it was about 30 years after the coup. Uh, essentially, everything that they said was corroborated not only with the other people I talked to, but also with this Wilbur history. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, and this was certainly not a question of these CIA officers trying to play up the CIA as you seem to be suggesting. You know, my main source was highly, highly anti-CIA, anti-American, uh, far, far more than I am. The last thing that he would do is try to play up the CIA, so I don't know what you're suggesting. Finally, I would say about this, and it's an important issue, that covert operations, much of what happens in them is never written down, and this was certainly the case in 1953. Uh, you know, the meetings they had with this person or that person, money given to this person, a statement made to that person, these things generally were not written down, okay? And if you want to find out about them as a researcher, you've got to go and talk to the people involved. There's no other way to do research on this kind of stuff. I talked to them all. Unfortunately, they're all dead now. I did bring one of them to the Oxford conference it was just a year or so before he died. And he talked to various people about that. But it's the only way to do research on this. Some historians are against the use of interviews as a research tool. I don't have to worry about that. I'm not a historian. I'm a political scientist. So I guess I can play by a different set of rules. But journalists use interviews for a large proportion of their work. In courts of law, people's testimony is often the major sort of thing that is used to come to a judicial decision. So why can't historians also use interviews in their work? Shot wrong. I'll never really kill me if I take the time to respond. You already got your PA. Yeah, you get response as a dinner table. He's been writing his turn for a long time. I'll come to him in just a moment. I think uh, Darius wants to have a quick comment as well. Very, very quick, in fact, what I wanted to say. If anything, in recent Malcolm Burns uh, revelation is new is the confirmation that the CIA documents in 1962 were destroyed, which dovetails, dovetails with a statement attributed to Richard Helms when he said apparently in a, in a uh, BBC interview that after 
the scandal of Bay of Pigs, therefore early 60s. CIA decided not to disavow its role in the CIA, in, in, in Mossadegh's downfall, just in order to keep its credit within uh, uh, the, 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 the Beltway for budgetary reasons. Now, this is what the director of CIA himself says in connection with uh, that, that uh, particular uh, point. Uh, but just to mention again uh, the, the, the question of, uh, of uh, the CIA, um, um, former CIA agents, I think it is perfectly legitimate for a historian or political scientist to cite them, provided that they are corroborated with documents. And what I can tell you, that the things that they have told you, none of them, none of them is corroborated in, in well, evidence. You know? Because I have, I have read your book, and I have read the internal history of the CIA, and I have seen that what they have told you does not um, 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 exist in, in, in that, that, that account. I was surprised that I... How Perhaps you and I should sit together and I uh, show you uh, page by page what I'm talking about. Um, uh, I debated this issue <coughs> uh, uh, and Mr. Bayander's view on two BBC programs, one of them with him, and then extensively today, uh, uh, this morning, uh, again, at uh, uh, breakfast. Uh, so, uh, he, here's what I have to say basically about this. Uh, in order for Mr. Bayandur to prove his thesis for an event that happened on the 28th of Mordad, 1332, 1953, an event that you cannot put a correct name on it, you still haven't chosen a name, because it's not Yami Milli, it's not Coup d'etat, it's some, something in between. Hopefully, a name will be chosen at some point. In order for that to be proven, you have to, as you say, undermine or diminish the validity of the already existing what you call conventional uh, evidence, which I can categorize in three. And I would like to say that in all three cases, uh, your attempt to diminish them is unconvincing as far as I'm concerned. First of all is CIA. Now, Mark Gazerowski, right now before us, gave us seven points about what the CIA did and did not do in those years, all the way to the toppling of the nationalist government and uh, you uh, basically completely ignored all of them. And uh, the evidence that you produce are two. One is an Under Secretary of State uh, by the name of General Smith writing to President Eisenhower telling him the coup d'etat had failed, which we already know that Washington believed the coup d'etat had failed. And, but that issue did not really impact the network in Tehran under Kermit Roosevelt. The second thing you have to prove about the CIA is that the network in Tehran, what they did and what Mark just said and what the evidence exists is nonsense or it is an exaggeration, it is unacceptable, it doesn't work. But you have to go point by point and prove it and which you, you don't. For example, the military network that Mark just mentioned on July 20th when the CIA team arrives. Now, we already know that there is some sort of a club, a retired general's club, after Mossadegh tried to Persian military, existing in Tehran by the time these people arrived. The CIA says that this network was ineffectual. It doesn't really exist in an effective manner. Mark Gazerowski tells you if it, did, it did, if it did exist, they would have moved against Mossadegh earlier. Your point about what he's saying, and he's trying to prove the, the, the essential role played by by the CIA, your only point is that no, it existed, it was functioning well, and it basically kicked in after the failure of Ajax on the 25th uh, of Mordor. I mean, th th that is unconvincing. Secondly, let me go to the second point. For you to bring the crowd, the, the civilian crowd in, and make it a major factor, something that Abraham Young 
uh, and God's will also get my stuff and everybody else basically fails to accept, that uh, does not accept, you need to bring a heavyweight. Behbahani, a court a cleric, and Kashani, a mid-level, mid-weight cleric, were not enough to bring a crowd bigger than 4,000. And that is the estimate we have. If you wanted a huge crowd, you need to bring in Behbahani, uh, I'm sorry, Burujeri, the Grand Hotel of Burujeri. You keep mentioning Burujeri, but when it comes to, okay, where is the evidence? You say it's not forensic. Well, if it's not forensic, it's in inadmissible. Since we are going court uh, language, if it is not forensic, you don't have an evidence. If you don't have an evidence, throwing his name out all the time doesn't make any sense to me. Third and last one. The military, very quickly, the military. For the military to have been effective, for, for, your, for your, your argument uh, to be proven, the military's role needs to be diminished. And you try to do that in your book and also in your presentation. What we know, that the military was in charge because of Mossadegh's order, after he ordered Tude and National Front to demobilize on the 27th of Murad. The military was in charge of Tehran on that eve. What is your proof? What proof? What proof? What what has ordered, uh, Love, uh, Kenneth Love also says that the military is in the street on the 27th. They are security forces that Mossadegh himself had ordered as of the morning of 18 uh, August, Mr. Hafter. Security forces? Security forces, yes. People from Farmandari and Nizami. Okay. Farmandari and Nizami. Did who Farmandari who were wearing the same did, uniform? Did Farmandari and Nizami have tanks? Who? Tanks? Tanks? Did, well, were there any tanks involved in the um, breakdown of to the crowd? You, who is who is a specialist in, 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 in to the party activities, have you anywhere come across the uh, evidence? That, of that night, there was any tanks involved? Where were these military forces? I have evidence that Mossadegh's home, when the Mossadegh's home was attacked by the military tanks were involved. There were five or six tanks, according to the... Five and six tanks are tanks, right? But yes, of course they are tanks. When they but attacked, listen, it's when tanks listen, were involved. Even, even the origin let, of... Just, this, let me, let, just let me finish again. Yes, Mossadegh's home. Point. Mossadegh was toppled. Mossadegh's home was attacked. His home was uh, bombarded and uh, sprayed with bullets. When? Not by the civilians, thugs or otherwise, but by the military. The military played the decisive role. This is a coup d'etat. My dear friend, if I may, read, read the... Uh, Maybe. By telling everybody to no, read, no, 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 not really no, 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 covering, I'm no, just no, criticizing, no, no, you have to answer the critique. Telling me to read does not answer. It's not an answer to my point. No, because, because I'm afraid from my contacts with you, I have noted that you, you're not in habit of reading documents. <laughs> I'm very he sorry. Just gave, he just gave I'm, you all I'm the documents that you needed. You he gave you seven to, points and documents. You, you you, the only thing you had to tell him was to read. You, constantly you cannot refer to go around and argue and about an academic work by telling others go and Maybe read. Maybe we should just cool it a little bit and go back go to, to talking memory. about the facts rather than each other. No, I was going to say, if he reads the memoirs of the Minister of Interior, of Mossadegh, he would tell you that at two o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon, when he left his Ministry of Interior downtown and made a tour of the city to arrive in Mossadegh's house around 2.30, quarter to, 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 to three, he had not come across any military unit. It was only after that military units from surrounding areas a start when they heard that the town is uh, sort of out, people are out supporting the Shah. At that point, those military people who I said, indeed, mm -hmm. rather junior line officers, some of whom had been identified with the Ajax coup, but some had not been identified. 
those people started to bring in their units and they attacked Mossad al house. But this is in the afternoon of Sahaj al Mordad, not in the evening of. of uh, that is a total in, invention. I don't know by who that on that night there were military forces and tanks out in the street. Please prove that to me. I'm sorry, you're too young to understand. I think, I think, I think maybe we need to break that there. That military, military army were units. I think, I think, I think I have to stop you both then. Can, we're very near the end of the session. But Can I please things. invite Mr. Martin Daftari to? Well, uh, I, I think Maziar actually means the martial law authority who were in charge of security at night. And they were all over the streets in Tehran every night, including that night. Right. And uh, the tanks, the next day that you mentioned that they didn't do anything, uh, I lived in the neighborhood. I was very close by. It was my own house, my uncle's house. The tank went and blew up the roof completely and several other buildings on the day of the coup in that afternoon that you mentioned. Um, I can't remember the time, it was in the afternoon, well after 2 o'clock. I think we fully agree, well we said the same thing. Dr. Martin Daftari, you said the same thing. Dr. 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 Martin, Dr. Was, that, no, 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 well after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I, uh, well, well after 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I was next door. And, uh, and let, I, I, I fully let, agree with let you. Let him make his point, please. He's mm. got the microphone. But, um, I mean, this was just by the way. What I, in fact, in fact, intended to say was that uh, we know that Ayatollah Burger did refrain from politics. I know personally that Ayatollah Burger did had excellent relationship with Mossadegh, an excellent liaison with Mossadegh, and Mossadegh, in fact, enacted a special law in favor of the Valayat, uh, in, in favor of the Marja Taqid Am obliging every prosecutor to immediately prosecute anyone who tries to, uh, the, to, uh, uh, to make uh, the defamatory abuses against Buru Jerdi because at that time uh, these forces that you, uh, have been mentioned who were tr trying to plot up and the ones around, especially Mr. Ka the Ayatollah Kashani they were planning to get the newspapers, which were done under, under the payroll, to start a campaign against Ayatollah Guru Jirdi, to undermine him and to undermine his position and replace him with Kashani. Uh, I have facts, I have, I have, I have interviewed people, and I have interviewed people close to Ayatollah Guru Jirdi, who have said all this to me and they have written for me. And there is another, there is another point also, that Ayatollah Behbani tried his best to get one line from Buru Jirdi and until the last night before the coup d'etat he went and called Ayatollah Ha'eri, the son of Sheikh Abdul Karim, the founder of the of seminary in Rome, highly respected by, uh, by uh, the Buru Jirdi, to go to Buru Jirdi and ask Buru Jirdi to, to write one line against uh, Mossadegh for the, for the, which they needed for the next day, and they had tried their best, and they had not been successful. And as it goes also in, uh, I've spoken personally to uh, Ayatollah Hayri, but as it also goes in the Harvard, um, the, 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 oral history, oral history. The, uh, oral history the Harvard oral, oral history, there's one volume on, uh, on Hayri, which, is, which has also been published by Fawla um, Javardi. Uh, he says very clearly uh, that I told him, look, I respect you, meaning uh, Behbani, I respect you and I will go to Harvard. And I, I will go to uh, Mr. Buru Jardi and the, the Ayatollah Buru Jardi and tell him all this. But at the end, Ayatollah Guru Jirdi will ask my own opinion, and I will give my own opinion. I'm against your opinion. 
And th this was his last resort, which was not successful. And Ayatollah Guru Jardi did not budge. And even when the Shah returned from his trip, from his uh, flight to Rome, he refused, he refused to send uh, special greetings until 10 days after his return and after so many emissaries asking him to do so. And um, I, I saw you, I saw you had, you, you, were, you made one, only one reference, one, only one proper reference, and that was to uh, Ayatollah Muntaziri. Uh, I don't often read uh, the documents very carefully, but points which interest me, I read them very, very carefully. And we went through Muntaziri's book, we didn't find any, any evidence whatsoever uh, and in fact, his evidence is contrary to what you claim that Mr. Montazeri has been saying. They want me to give and, you the page number? And you, you have brought the page number. I, 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 I will give you a volume. I don't, I, I, unfortunately, we don't have a volume of Montazeri's memoirs here. And we would have read it. I would have loved the, to the, have it. So the that reference that you give, you the reference that you time. give, sir. Maybe we can communicate the, reference the page that you number give, sir, outside the is, event. Uh, is out of context completely. Has, well, has nothing to do with out of context. To, to is explain. your interpretation what I recollect from Montazeri's comments on that was two or three things. First, that Ayatollah Brujerdi was very sensitive towards communism. Number one. Number two, that he considered Mossadegh indifferent towards religion. He used the word la beshat. Does that tell you anything to remember from uh, uh, Montazeri's memoirs? He said, Brujerdi thought Mossadegh was la beshat about the religion. I'm talking about Montazeri quoting Ayatollah Buru Jardi, and it is in his memoirs. If you have not seen it, then I think you should go back again and read it. And another thing that he has said, another thing that he has said, he says on the evening of Misahash the Mordant, when they were in fact in Osh, where the, 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 the summer residence of uh, Buru Jardi, and there Montazeri says some 30 clerics were, uh, were, were praying and they were reading uh, a, a particular religious text, uh, the name of which escapes me. And then someone barged in and gave the news of the fall of Mossadegh. There you would read, you would see that one cleric, in fact, uh, prostates in front of everyone and says, thanks God, we got rid of this man. This is in the house of Ayatollah Brujerdi, and this is what Montazeri, who was... You don't quote the rest of the quotation. Yeah, you just quote that, not the rest of the thing. Please quote the rest of it. No, but... That no, but that... But, but you, you quote. Please let me see in what way it's different. Quote it. What it means that in the residence of Ayatollah Burujerdi, I think we all know that he was silent. The question is, but what does this have to do with the overthrow of Mossadegh? Did Burujerdi organize crowds or didn't he? I think we probably should wind that up there very quickly, Ali Ansari, and then I think we're going to have to finish. I first, first stop to answer. No, 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 this goes a little bit too too far. I totally I totally reject this kind of a statement that he was my friend. There is no friendship between me and him and you don't know nothing about it. Mr. Cotton, a number of times in the BBC television, he mentioned himself 
that this crown was a rented crown. This is the word of cotton. What you don't know, and I tell you, is that. Yes, indeed. Cotton. I think, I think we have to. Cotton, let me just say that yeah. for, for his benefit. In fact, initially, when he was still part of the crowd, has clearly described the crowd, crowd as spontaneous. And what he said in his earlier writing was that they were not of the nature of the mob that you ordinarily saw in Tehran streets. In other words, he would give them some distinction that, in my opinion, probably they did not have. But that was the opinion of Khatam at that point. Exactly the same thing that exactly the same thing that Henderson wrote. I think Henderson wrote in his report to to Washington the day after. Thank you. Uh, very very quickly, Alex. I just have a, ve a, a very short question, by the way, and I don't know the answer to it, but I'd love to know if anyone has there been a Russian account of this bit. Have any of the documents of the Russian Soviet archives been released? We'll hear about that tomorrow. Do, I mean, have they been? Has there been a Russian account? Or, I mean, uh, quick answer. Yeah. So that that's what because this seems to be the one gap at the moment that nobody seems to have really that uh, that side. There's an answer to that question. Very brief one, uh, but it's not going to settle. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, do you? Yes, uh, I think we need to get out of here. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, a long, long afternoon. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, I think I can report back to Anthony Vinci <laughs> from my lecture in Washington. <laughs> Thank you once again very, very much.